Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, Nashville Session Drumming Stable, Nick Buda. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, folks out in podcast land? Yep, it's that time. Your clock, your iPhone is correct. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show, where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success, all the good things in life. We need that stuff. There's nothing but sad tales on the news. I had to stop watching the news, and then during this whole crazy thing, I got back on the news, and and I'm now I'm off of it again, and that's probably a great thing. But hey, you know, usually I have my co-host Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy Voiceovers He's a little tied up today. I figured I would just nerd out, anyways, with a good friend of mine. Today's guest, I mean, you'd have to be living. Uh, your head would be in the sand for a lifetime to not know who this guy is. And we were just talking off camera before this all started, and we were, and I was like. Can you believe it's probably been years since we saw each other? But, you know, with social media, you can kind of keep tabs on each other and, and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to catch up today. Today's guest hailing from Cape Town, South Africa. He's an A-list recording drummer, producer and studio owner. He owns the Loft Studio in Nashville. And just look at some of these names he's played with. Dolly Parton, Taylor Swift, Martina McBride, Derek, Derek Trucks, Edwin McCain, Maya Sharp. The list goes on and on. My friend, Nick Buda. What is up, Nick? How are you, man? Hey, thanks for having me, Rich. Happy to yeah. be here. Oh, man. You know, it is so fun. I'm schwitzing a little bit today. I got so many lights on me. If I turned my camera around, you'd see all these darn lights that I bought during uh, COVID. For, so we get nice production value here. But you're com- I'm uh, in like Brantioch, Brentwood, Nippers Corner area with my studio, Crash Studio. And you're coming from East Nashville, right? Your loft studio? Absolutely. I didn't actually even know that you were in Nashville right now, but between here and LA, but there you go. Um, yes, crazy. I am. I'm in the East side, uh, North Inglewood. Actually, we have a place that we've been here for about a year. The loft I've had for many years and it's kind of moved with me whenever I've moved right now. Right. We're in a place that's right on the river, which is absolutely beautiful. So, nice. so it's the river loft at the moment. Um, well, actually probably for quite a few years cause we love this place and, yeah. and um, uh, yeah, and the studio sounds great in here, and everything's been zooming along. Nice, man. Well, I remember, I think that we caught up, oh, my God, maybe mid last year and had some cervezas and some cigars over there to Sabian Hang in, in Midtown. Right. That was the last time I saw yeah. you. And before that, it had yeah. probably been, well, 2020 was a blur. It was it not? I mean, we were just yeah. talking about yeah. these two years. How, did, how was your yeah. pandemic? Tell me, how did you handle it? It was interesting, man. I, I, I got to say, in one sense, I, I felt lucky. It was weird. Everything just kind of stopped, right? And um, and even there were some people that were trying to hang on to sessions, even when things got a little scary. And I kind of backed out of quite a few situations because we didn't know what was going on. Right. Um, and what was weird, I don't know if you, you, you actually, you told me you were in LA, which obviously always has nice weather, but in Nashville, the weather uh, in the spring of 2020 was unbelievable. It was the perfect days every day. So we went for walks every day. And I mean, it was obviously weird for everybody. Everything shut down. But I was super thankful to not be in a small apartment in a big city. You know, we, we oh, were yeah. very lucky to be where we were. And then a few months after that, you know, a couple people started putting their toes in the water with some sessions. And um, obviously, everybody was masked. And instead of hanging out in the control room to listen to the song uh, before we were going to record it, everybody stayed at their instruments and we just had their headphones and we, you know, looking at our charts and whatever. Hang wasn't there and I was obviously different, but we got through it. We got to work still, you know, and um, uh, if you were careful, you kind of kept the virus at bay, you know, yeah. so uh, it, it took it was probably about three months, three to four months that that it was full on lockdown. We like we didn't do any kind of work. I did some remote stuff from home because that was kind of happening a little bit. So I was lucky yeah. to have that going. Um, but I got to say, in in retrospect, I, I I didn't mind it so much for me personally. It gave me a good perspective on what we do, work, family, the time spent on each, what. I love doing and what I want to do. You know, it was, it turned out to actually be a pretty, 
big blessing in disguise. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. There's a, there was a reset, and you know, like I worked on my hands. I taught at uh, Musicians Institute. I did all of my, um, you know, I have an acting coach. I have a speaking coach, and um, did a lot of auditions. And then I had to fly a lot to from LA to Nashville. Did a lot, did some recordings with Jason and some other folks. And you yeah. just we just did it yeah. because the music calls, man, and you want to do those things. So. Um, so we were just talking that you're coming up on 20 years in Nashville. And I remember meeting you because back in the day we would, you know, everyone has kind of like watering holes and we would all kind of like hang out. Musicians would meet and would create projects and hire each other and kibitz and schmooze over at the red door in Midtown. And then I also we would right. spend a lot of time. Maybe we'd spend a lot of time over at like Douglas Corner, the basement, the Sutler, like old Sutler. Yeah. Dude, the old Sutler in 2004, 2005, 2006. I mean, I played there with like Emily West, Lisa Torres, and we would swap gigs. <laughs> yeah. back at, like all these up and coming singer songwriters. Some of, some of these folks became right. like super high profile um, hit songwriters. People got signed to record deals. People lost record deals. But it was just this cool thing right. where I would, I would roll up with like a, a snare and a pedal and my charts and you would do the same thing. Easy load in. Right. The place had so much character. We would do these showcases and gigs with people, and then I would hightail it out to, um, you know, like Cool Springs or whatever, and get on Al Dean's bus and go try to build his thing that was happening. Right. It, right. Was, it was a really special time. You remember that period? It was like 2004, 2005. Incredible. I love that period. I can't, I can't imagine life now when I think about life then because we were – hitting it all the time. I mean, I don't think there was a night that I was home before one thirty or two. Yeah. Cause we were just like, we would do gigs, then everybody would go out for drinks. And then, I mean, and that was, and I look back, sometimes I have to look back to, I don't know, find something in my calendar from like, when, when did this happen? Blah, blah, blah. And those days were like, especially once session started, which was towards, you know, 2000, whatever it was, seven, six, seven, eight, something like that. I first kind of started doing sessions yeah. and started getting sessions during the day, then do a gig at night or maybe two gigs at night, going bouncing from one to the other. And it was like you say, these singer songwriters, we would maybe do a lineup of two or three of them doing like eight songs a piece yeah. so at like, you know, 12th and Porter or whatever it was. And then we'd go out for drinks after I'd get home at two o'clock. Like, that was a much younger me, <laughs> but it was super fun, right? It was super transformative. And we learned, I feel like we learned so much from playing so uh, such a wide variety of different music and so much of it. You know what I mean? Totally. And when yeah. you were, and you were coming to Nashville with like, kind of like a stylistic pedigree because um, not, not to backtrack too far right now, but you know, you're, I'm sure you're, you're, you could tell us about your musical upbringing, but then, you know, you're playing with Colonel Bruce Hampton. You went to right. Berkeley. Um, right. You know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff in your, in your toolbox. Um, and your playing style is, I mean, there's just like this golden groove, nice balance between the limbs. Um, you know, all the stylistic variations. There's a lot of subtlety and detail in your playing. Uh, even if when you're playing an old boom schmack, boom boo schmack with like a, like a gutter rock band, there's this maturity and depth to it. There's a, there's a lot of percolation. It just goes to show you that, you know, everybody is so interesting. You know, you could put you and I on the same drum set with the same artist and it's it's going to be different. It's just such a special right. thing. Yeah, right. It is a special thing. And by the way, I've just in, while we've been talking, I trademarked Golden Groove. Uh, <laughs> there'll be there'll be a goldengroove.com soon enough. <laughs> I love it. Goldengroove.com. I man. love it. That's awesome. I need to have a gold kick drum front head with Golden Groove. On I mean, though. you don't want to be a, you don't have a silver or a bronze groove, man. You want to go for the gold, you know? No. Please. Yeah, yeah. No, but you're right. And, and it's, and it comes down to, to the individual touch and, and how we approach uh, the song that we're playing, you know, and how we where all the stuff, like you say, in the toolbox and, and all the history that comes to that one point of the decisions we're making in the song, you know, that's, and that's what differentiates us, which is, which is beautiful, which is awesome. You know? Yeah, no, but I, I love that hustle. I mean, that, that hustle, that period of our life where we are kind of like, making our dreams come to fruition. We're trying to set ourselves apart and create this um, reliable um, kind of our, 
<laughs> kind of our, our pedigree, our reputation yeah. that precedes us in Nashville. And we were willing to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work. It's so funny. I talked to a lot of these um, younger kids that are coming to town nowadays and some of the nightclubs and stuff that, you know, the Douglas and Corners have closed. The Settler's not quite yeah. the same. There isn't that 12th yeah. and Porter special scene anymore. Third and Lindsley is, I love Third and Lindsley, but I really loved it when the, you know, the Wooten brothers and everybody were just in the corner across from the pinball machine. Oh, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Right. But a, a lot of them are just like, no, I don't want to play Laura Broadway and I don't want to hustle that hard. I'm just going to put my room together and, and I'm going to do that thing or I'm just going to do the road gig and special in Ableton. It's like, we were just like, man, we want to play Let anything, anything and everything. Everything. That's right. Yeah. And and I think that that we were also had this idea of like, uh, I wanted, I want to do all of it and scoop up as much as I can in the building of the life. Like it wasn't like, I just, there was a, there was a goal. There was an end goal to what we were doing back then i mean we couldn't foresee which way the industry was going to go i mean when you think about where technology was in in the in the 2000s before 2010 it's light years away from where it is now you know right. and the music industry was light years away from where it is now you know i mean it has really changed but that was not of any concern we just this was the life we were doing and we wanted to dig in hard then and I mean, I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like I'm still kind of digging in hard, but in a different, in a little more of a relaxed, more right. controlled kind of way. Then it was just, <laughs> you know, whatever, yeah. you know, no, so yeah. No, but you, but you, you definitely set yourself apart and now you're part of Music Row Elite, you know, the phone rings off the hook, all sorts of producers have great things to say about you. Um, what was the, what, what was the, um, Am I right in saying one of your first opportunities in Nashville was this gal, Cindy Thompson? When I read the wiki today, I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, I haven't heard that name in forever. Uh, what what happened to her? Like, she had a career that was all laid out for her. Like, she, I think she did The Tonight Show really quickly. And then all of a sudden, she's like, nah, I don't want to do this. Wasn't that your first job? One of your first at jobs? The, it was. At, at the time, she was the fastest new artist to hit number one. And uh, um, I should say the new artist to hit number one fastest, whatever. And um, I had gotten a call from that. She had already had that success. Um, she just coming off that and she was still had a song in the top five or something. And um, my friend Bruce Wallace needed a sub for a gig. I met him through another close high school friend of mine, Ethan Pilzer, a bass player. Yes. And, um, and Bruce asked me if I could sub on this gig. I'd been in Nashville not even two months. Awesome. And this was Cindy opening up for Alan Jackson at Great Woods up in Boston, you know, and I was like, oh, man, that's awesome. So um, that's when I first met my good friend, Steve Mackey, who's, who's one of the most unbelievable bass players, you know, and, and totally. we met on that we instantly became best buds and have played together since. Um, and that whole thing was such a my, it was such a whirlwind because I'd never played with tracks before. I'd never, you know, I mean, playing with Colonel Bruce, you just go up there and freaking slay for two plus hours. You're not thinking about tracks or even any kind of like uh, conciseness in your approach. It's just right. about going. And then Cindy was complete opposite style. And thankfully, Bruce and I were good enough friends because I told him, I was like, hey, man, I'm coming from freaking jam band world. I need you to tell me when I've overstepped. Like when we have a night and I've done too much. You can tell me. And there were a couple of nights he was like, ah, maybe we need to pull it back just a little bit. <laughs> but, I, but I learned, but I learned how to maneuver around all that stuff. And I love that gig. Anyway, Cindy, uh, the, she just started having a really hard time with her label. Uh, a lot of the radio programmers were a little creepy. And she's a beautiful she's woman. Beautiful. And, and, uh, beauty and always helps things. Uh, it really uh, does kickstart. Beauty things. does help. But in this case, it actually kind of hurt a little bit because they... I mean, they, they didn't treat her be the best. And I think she just decided I need a break from this, even though you're right. She was, her second album could have put her over the edge. She could have been a, um, you know, whoever, you know, um, huge yeah. success. I think, I think she chose family. She chose yeah. to not have to deal with all that. And that's, that was what it was. And that was yeah. also the end of the gig. 
Dude, and I had to look and, for something else. <laughs> and it happens, you know, and I like I always say, like, this is such a hard thing because something happens at the label, the person, your, you know, your key person inside the label gets fired, and then you have a whole brand new team and they don't see the vision, or someone gets pregnant, or somebody chooses, you know, marriage and family, God forbid, over the music business. But it happens yeah, all the right. time. And we're we're one gig away from uh, you know, unemployment and, and freelancing, you know. Um yeah, but then, honestly, you've had you've you have you've had one of the few successes where where you started the gig, you rode the 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 trail the the trail up with the gig. Yeah, you still have the gig. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's extremely few and far. Thank between. God like, you well, don't have very yeah. many scenarios. And and thank I mean you have built a um, a huge career off of deciding that you were going to play with this one guy that ended up turning into what it's turned into, which I think is. That deserves commending on its own. Forget oh. about all the other stuff. You Thank know? you. So, yeah, yeah, I sure anyway. appreciate it. Man. Well, I mean, 20 years, we we definitely have, uh, you know, had some ups and downs. The music business is a roller coaster, but, you know, it really is. My guy brought me back down memory lane thinking about Steve Mackey, who I've done tons of sessions oh. with. Not as many as both you guys, because you guys are like freaking frack. You definitely have a thing. Um, yeah. Bruce Wallace, I used to play, you know, uh, with him at the Bluebird and we would have to play like super right. soft and we back up all these chick singers. So he called me for a lot of stuff. And then you and I yeah. were on us call list. I mean, you just want to be on that call list. And then who else was there that you mentioned? Ethan Pilzer. We did the, um, we did the big Kenny gig when he was on Hollywood records with Adam Schoenfeld riding around in a 15 passenger van all up down the highways and byways of America in wow. 1999, yeah. man. So it's like, wow. It, yeah, it's this fraternity of people that, you know, champion each other and are looking out for each other. And you want to get on that list. And somehow you and I made it on those lists where it's like, well, call Nick. It's it's going to be great. Yeah. And he's got this kind of a thing. And then you can call Rich and he's got this kind of a thing. But but I think what people were saying is you can, you can trust these guys because they're going to show up with a smile on their face. They're going to be prepared. They're, they're going to be able to, be to take direction. Go. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Nick, take us back, man. You um take us back to Cape Town. Like what was the initial um thing that got you wanting to do the thing? Who were some of your drummers that caught your attention? Was there there was there MTV? Did you guys have Nina Blackwood and JJ Jackson? Did you get the thing there? How did that all happen? We didn't have anything. When I was a kid living in Cape Town, there were three TV channels that started, I believe, at like uh, 5 p.m. and ran till midnight. And they had whatever programming on it. We didn't have MTV. We didn't have – the radio we had was okay, but it wasn't like American radio. Um, I would get – I would find out music. And, of course, it was pre-internet, right? So we didn't have – there was just no – it was – Cape Town couldn't have been further away. You know what I mean? Everything we got was, was six to nine months behind – uh, Europe in the United States, you know, wow. um, but I loved, I just loved drums. I never, not, there was no one instance that I, that got me loving drums. I've just always loved playing. I used to hit on furniture with cooking spoons when I was a kid. I mean, I played a lot. My mom used to play uh, James Taylor and uh, freaking Loggins and Messina and all this oh, sort of yeah. stuff when I was a kid. There was, there was, there was good music around me for me to play along with. Um, and I remember always, uh, my, I always had like a revolving three to five drummer idol list and Carlos Vega was almost always on there. Nice. Um, Vinny, obviously Gad, obviously. um, and then, and then, you know, like some people like Olive Jean Lake, who I think is incredible. There were certain other people that kind of meandered in and out, but I'd have to say Vega, Picaro, Gad, Vinny were four that kind of stayed on there all the time and they have differences in their playing which i find they're so unique that but yet so musical that's what that's what kind of drew me to it you know and I, yeah and uh i didn't even really start playing drums uh really until we moved to the states because there was just no there was no real way in cape town that just there wasn't enough influence there and we moved right when i was about 12 and that really that was a turning point you know so well, i yeah. could definitely hear those guys in your playing because you know carlos always really played great for the song but he also played like with uh some smooth jazz and stuff so he had some stuff going on he had that facility but always a, a you know yeah. a slave to the, the song structure painting that beautiful picture jeff same thing 
all the little stuff in the left hand and and just that you know the attention to the shaft the shaft of the stick and the tip of the stick on the hi hat almost like a shaker um yeah i could i hear you taking chances like Vinny and then gene lake oh, uh, yeah. I, I only know him from the uh michelle indicello records you know like in the mid yeah yeah um you know yeah um, yeah, 90s, yeah but i hear all that <laughs> stuff easily yeah, exactly. I, I like guys that have a lot of personality in their playing. You know, I find sometimes what's missing these days, particularly in the country genre, and maybe yeah. a little bit as we've gotten into uh, the the era of Pro Tools and 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 editing being as easy as it is, a yeah. lot of personality has been taken out, and I feel like that's that's a detriment to young players now because I'm not sure who they look to as much unless you start looking they just look further back i'm not sure you know but yeah. man the guys that i used to follow i uh, to me they were explosive they were like you say musical within the song i mean all that stuff and it wasn't hard to find that stuff back then i feel like you needed to have that to help make the, the I, I can't think of a scenario of an artist that i really liked back then that didn't have not just drummers but all the players in the band brought their personalities in you know yeah yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, what was the so? What did your folks do that you moved to the states when you were was it thirteen or so? Yeah, I turned thirteen in the states. We moved like half. I was like twelve and a half or so. Um, well, my mom was actually she was a, a sort of fashion designer and into and just very anti everything that was going on in South Africa. It was right in the middle of apartheid. Oh, yeah, things absolutely. were things were bad there. Um, and my stepdad at the time uh, was a like a producer. And then my mom's younger sister um, was an artist. Uh, she was like a young pop artist in Cape Town. Wow. Like I say, pre-internet, you might as well have been a young pop artist on Mars because <laughs> it was so <laughs> far off the grid, right? So the idea was to move to the States and we would start a life outside of South Africa, you know, somewhere, um, you know, where we could root and then um she my aunt debbie would kind of grow her musical career now there were a lot i mean we had no idea of what life of here was like and and it was all very sudden and 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 it took a while to transition but uh yeah i i, I owe everything to my mom having the freaking strength and i can't even understand what that would be like to uproot and make it work it was not easy it was very hard for for a while but wow uh, i only i only felt some of it as a kid and um and somehow we made it somehow we i mean we talk about it even today it comes up every once in a while like how difficult it was back then to get through and and somehow we we got through you know we're here part of it too and this this is neither here nor there but we did we didn't necessarily move 100 percent legally <laughs> Kind of pick up and laugh. <laughs> so, so we lived on uh, we lived on very little money over here. And it so was, we're talking and like powdered pa powdered milk and 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 white and rich mom, bread. Yeah, my mom talks about going to Kroger with a with a twenty bucks to figure out food for the week kind of vibe. They you know get really I mean? creative there. So, wow, that, that's right. So, that, so yeah, she she takes a lot of the credit for us still being here because a lot of people who wanted to leave South Africa in those days lasted a few months, couldn't do without the, the lifestyle that they had gotten used to in particularly in Cape town, which is an absolutely beautiful city. We left yeah. a house on the side of the mountain overlooking the ocean to move to a little apartment here in Nashville um, with nothing, you know, essentially, but only just to be not there and here and just to, to start a life here. And so it was, yeah, it was challenging. Wow. buddy. And so do you, do you still have your folks? Are they still with us? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. My mom lives in upstate New York, and um, my dad, my mom and dad split up when I was a little kid. My dad still lived. Uh, actually, until recently, he still lived in Cape Town, and now he's living in London. Oh, okay. Now, now, now didn't your dad instill in you a love of fast cars? Don't you have a couple fast cars that mm. you enjoy on the weekends? I don't know. I don't know exactly where the, I've. I've actually always had a love for cars, and. I and yeah, my dad has always he's always had some some fancy cars over the years here and there. Um, and yes, I I do love cars. I, I feel like had I been around, let's say go kart racing when I was a kid, if I'd grown up somewhere Middle America or West Coast or something and been around go kart racing, that might have I may not have ever played drums. <laughs> I love I love cars so much, and that and that could have easily been a thing. But what are you, uh, what are you driving now, buddy? What do you like? Because you know I, I you don't have to move drums anymore, really. You know, you we show no, up. I really don't. 
Yeah, I'm so lucky. Um, I have a BMW M3 and um, it's even, <laughs> so I have a five-year-old and I re- now I have a five-month-old. Oh, I don't even know if you knew that. Yeah, I was looking at, um, I was looking at the Instagram and I was like, wow, your family has grown. Tell us about that too. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know how it happens. No, no. Um, <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> we, uh, so we had um, my daughter, like I said, a little over five years ago and th- she's been amazing. And then we decided, you know, I mean, uh, I'm an only child, which with no regrets, I mean, it's great. Um, my wife has a younger sister and was just like, I, it would be great if Eddie got to grow up with somebody and blah, blah. And we were, and we're thankful to be in a great place as we are. And so, yeah, five months ago, we, we had a little boy and um, they're great. And I will say my M3 is a little small for the two kids, but we're hanging in there for right now. Yeah. <laughs> My daughter's like, she loves the car and she loves going fast. And that's awesome. Oh my God. She's like, it's too cramped back here. <laughs> so we'll, we'll work it out. That's funny. Is it? So that's Addy and Ollie. Is that right? Yeah. Oliver. Yeah. Ollie. Yeah. Oliver. Awesome, man. Congratulations, buddy. I mean, this is great, Thanks, man. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a lucky guy. Very, very nice. And um, so when you, when you get to Nashville, <clears throat> the bug keeps happening even more. What's the thing yeah. that I read that Vinny told you to go to Berkeley? Did you go like see a show or something? He was like, hey, kid, make sure you go do this. Tell us about that. So when I was in my last year of high school, I went to go see Stig at what then was Starwood, the amphitheater here. Here in and, um, and I, a friend of my mom's was, was a journalist uh, who was writing a book on on Sting had been like a biography and had been for a long time. So I took the chance of just knocking on the backstage door and asking for Vic, Vic Garberini and saying, hey, it's Vic back there. He's expecting me. You know, I, he had no idea I was going to be there. And he was. So he came up to the gate and he was like, yeah, come on in. So I went backstage with him. Sting was doing some interviews in like a courtyard area. And he just like, yeah, follow me, follow me. So we went to this backstage room and the whole band's in there, which is, was, it was just the four piece band at that point. So it was, um, so Vinny and um, Dominic and um, Sanctious, I think, was playing keys. And um, all of a so I'm all of a sudden I'm in this room with Vic and the band, and then Sting comes in because he's done with his interviews or whatever, and it's like 15, 20 minutes before they're going on stage, and we're just yapping, just talking about stuff. Love and it. I'd never obviously I'd never met Vinny before at that point, and he was one of my idols, and then sure. obviously Sting. And so the conversation came up about he was talking about his time at Berkeley. <clears throat> and Sting asked, like, oh, you, is that the Berkeley over in uh, that Stewie went to, Stuart Copeland, who he went to Berkeley out in California. Right. And so Vinny was explaining the difference. And and so we and Vinny and I talked, because I was at that point, I was pretty revved up to go to Berkeley at that at that stage. And so Vinny was like, definitely, man, do it. You know, it was a great experience and all this sort of stuff. Super nice guy. And I found out, like the year I started Berkeley, Sting sent his kid who was still in high school to the Berkeley summer camp. And I, I mean, I'll take credit for it. I'm pretty sure that that all happened because of me. So, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, like, yeah. So that was like like 90, 91, 92, somewhere in there. Uh, I started Berkeley in 90. Shoot. When did I start? 93. So this would have been 92. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like early 92 or something. Yeah, I think and, you're, a little, um, you're probably a little younger than just a couple years younger than me because I at in 93, I was starting my master's at UNT. So we're probably a couple years. Oh, apart. Wow. yeah, 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 yeah. I went to Berkeley in 93. I, I left in uh, early 96. Yeah, yeah. Did you graduate? I did somehow. I had no intention of what. In fact, I rebelled against the idea of graduating, but. I kept taking classes as I was tour. I was doing like tours, with like uh, local bands and like around the n- the Northeast and everything I'm taking classes during the week. And somehow I was like within a year's worth of credits away from graduating. And I didn't have, if somebody had come to me right then and said, Hey, I've got a tour. Come on. I probably would have gone. But mom was like, hey, you're so close. Just finish, finish. it up already. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, did. I mean, I don't know that I'll use that degree for anything but i got it and 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 i'll say in retrospect again it was a great experience i I was really worn out on it at the time but man i got to do i got thrown into situations that you just would never get thrown into if you weren't in that environment you know so i am thankful for the time i had there you know 
Absolutely, man. In North Texas, it's like, you know, we're you're in the you're in the lab band hall and the charts get passed out and then Randy Brecker walks in or Lou Marini walks in or, you know, and you're you're like, you got to half the yellow jackets walk in and you're sight reading a chart. And, you, you know, you, those are priceless experiences that are definitely going to inform your store, you know. Yeah. And if and if you had the option, you'd probably back away from it. But you don't. You're freaking thrown in and you have to do it. And you're like, holy shit. And you get through it. and You're like, OK, I could I, I actually did OK. Like I didn't suck completely, you know. Right. So, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, yeah. To totally. And then then did you after uh, Berkeley, did you did you like Boston? Did you like the culture there? Would you, would you consider like hanging there a little bit? Most guys will hang a little bit, you know, or but did you just yeah. hightail it back to Nashville? No, no, no. I stayed there for another few months. Um, and I'm trying to think what ended up really bringing me back to Nashville, but I, I mean, obviously I have roots in Nashville, um, and I had some folks that were ready to hire me to do some stuff. So I, I stayed up there for the, for like the spring and summer of whatever, what was that? 96, I guess. And then moved down here in the fall of that here back to Nashville and started working. I started doing, um, I recorded a couple of rock records with some random bands. I can't remember even how I got into them, but that somehow it happened. And those were kind of my early recording experiences. Like I mean, um, Berkeley gave me my first real recording experiences because they, you do projects with friends and all that sort of stuff and you end up in the studio. Uh, and then I was in Nashville. And then, I mean, I was here for about three years and then Colonel Bruce popped on the radar and I went out, I moved to Atlanta and did that, you know. Now, was that a double gig with Jeff Sipe? Was he the guy that you double drummed with? He, no, um, I actually, then, the only time I actually double drummed on that gig was when we had Richie <laughs> Haywood come and fit in with us. Awesome. Which Richie had been one of my heroes too. I mean, playing along with Little Feet when I was a kid and all that sort of stuff. So uh, with Colonel Bruce, you could, there was never... Uh, and an end to what surprises could come just because he was such a central figure in that whole scene, you know, the, the sort of jam band, Southern rock kind of whatever scene. And so uh, we had people come sit in with us all the time. And at one point he stayed like, uh, Richie Haywood's going to be in town. Uh, why don't you set up a little kit for him? To come play with us for nice. Shit. Okay. So I, I had my kit and I set up another kit for him and he comes like somewhere in the set, he comes and sits in and we play pretty much the whole rest of the gig together, you know, and uh, and he and I actually became friends uh, chatting on the phone a few times and kind of keeping in touch a little bit before he died. Nice. That was it was uh, yeah, it was it was surreal, to be honest, the whole so, hanging out with the whole band, like Little Feet, because we opened for them for quite for quite a few gigs. And that whole thing was surreal too. like these guys. I've listened to the, uh, you know, those those albums. I, countless times playing along with them and here I am hanging with them and that started happening you know like that that gig was the beginning of my holy cow I, that guy's been in my life since I, I, I started playing drums and now we're actually hanging out you know it yeah. was it was a great experience yeah <laughs> if you keep working hard sorry about this little cough here um um, if you keep working hard, you know, your heroes become your friends and colleagues. It's a, like a really crazy thing. It's inevitable. And yeah. when it happens, you're like, wow, these guys poop and pay taxes and they have the same stresses and worries as the rest of us. They got to schlep their gear into the club. They got to like pay their self-employment taxes. I mean, it's pretty cool. It is really cool. You just kind of you just somehow sort of meld into the game and then you're one of the guys yeah. somehow you know i don't know yeah. i don't know how it happens and i never really think of myself like that but then i'm i'm doing the things we're all doing the same things you know what i mean yeah 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 so uh, tell us about you know obviously we talk about relationships and the power of relationships a lot on this show and I speak to it when I speak to corporate America and stuff. It's such a powerful thing because it's not resumes really that get you work or slick websites, but relationships, you know, with real human beings that champion each other. People want to work with people they know, they like, they trust. So how did the relationship with Nathan Chapman, the, the producer for um, all the Taylor Swift records come along? And I believe you played on all of her country records, including that very first record, which is amazing. And yeah. so for all the Taylor Swift fans out there or the drummers that, that have been playing along with those Taylor Swift records, that's Nick. Tell us about that, man. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, another good bass player friend of mine is Tim Marks. And he and I have been friends since we both kind of moved to around the same time and ended up on a gig together and became friends from there on up. And at some point, and I, and I decided to take a little money and invest in a little home studio. It wasn't much, but I knew I wanted to get into recording work. And I thought if I had a little rig at home, uh, I could at least offer my services to people as a kind of bait 
to them for them to get into me and then hire me on their sessions kind of Absolutely, time, yeah. you know and so tim had told me about a, a guy that he knew who was doing like just basement demos pretty much playing everything himself who needed drums on a couple things and i was pretty insecure about my rig at that point because i just i was just getting into it but i called him and this was nathan and he came over and we, he just liked the vibe. We just vibed really well. He liked what I played on the thing. And we're talking about in a bedroom. Like I had a very limited setup in a bedroom, you know? Um, and so he started doing more uh, demos in, in studios and hiring me and Tim to play on it. And Ch uh, Chad Carlson was the engineer because we, we were doing it a lot at Sound Emporium. And he was like one of the house guys then at that yeah. point. And, and then Nathan would take him home and finish them all up himself because he plays most things, you know? Yeah, all and, the um, yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's incredible. So, and that was about a year's worth of doing, I don't know, it seemed like a session a week or more sometimes. It was just insane. Like he was just, he got into it big time. And one of the people that came in, uh, one of the co-writers that came in was Taylor. Yeah, And so, because Liz Rose, he did all of Liz Rose's demos and Liz had written with Taylor and brought her in. And at the time, Taylor was already recording her record with Big Machine um, with a different producer and just liked the vibe of us. It was just such a small band, me and Tim and Nathan playing and making these tunes come together. And she went back to Borchetta of her Big Machine and said, I, I don't want to do it this way anymore. I want to go with these guys. These nice. young guys that have no resume, like nothing. We've never been like, we're just starting to become session guys. Right. And uh, of course, Borchetta said, no, that's ridiculous. You know, you got to, you know, you're, you're halfway into making a record or whatever it was. So, uh, and she put her foot down. She said, no, I want to do it. I want to do it like this. And so he, he essentially gave Nathan enough rope to hang himself. with we'll get, get, do these three songs. Here's a, like the most limited budget for three songs. And uh, let's see what happens. And of course, he worked his ass off and, and Borchetta was impressed, did another three to another three, whatever it was. And uh, next thing you know, somehow the record came together and came out and then did what it did. You know, we didn't honestly know what we were doing. And I don't think any of us actually thought I was just excited because it was the first time I was getting paid master scale on something. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I thought it was cool that we were. And we were getting to do this. Nobody was anybody at that point. So My we were God. just doing it. You know? Well, that's a, that's yeah. a really special thing. Cause you can go like, you can go like, yeah, we can do, we can do the tried and true thing that it's been proven a million times and it's safe. But she was like, no, I want to do this. I mean, that's really, you know, she really put herself out there. That's take, she took a she risk. Did, and she was 15, you know, I mean, when she was making these bold calls, she was 15 and somehow, not only writing these incredible songs, because a lot of people think like, yeah, but did she really write? Like, was she a co-writer on it, but somebody else really wrote the tune? Right. And I got to tell you, she wrote all that stuff. And even Liz has said in the past that she helped Taylor with the edges, but Taylor had the song, you know, and, yeah. um, and, it, and we saw it in the studio. We, we would be tracking a song and she's sitting in the back of the studio playing and like the music stops and we hear her and she's got like a chorus of another song that's freaking badass that she's just sitting there. She just has it in her head. So she wants to kind of get it out real quick or something. I mean, she's, she's incredible like that. And we got to be a part of a really great journey because then that first record did so well. And I remember, I remember being in the car the first time I heard it on the radio and it was because it was, it was some, one of those radio shows on, on whatever station here, I can't remember where they were putting it up against another new release but by a big artist it was so like sm new artist, smash new it or trash it you know that exactly exactly that's exactly what it was and her song won over I, like i can't remember if it was a martina mcbride song or, so, or some whatever whoever it was yeah and that was the i was like whoa how cool and i was actually on my way to nathan's house when this happened so when I saw him, I was like, dude, did you hear the thing? And he was like, yeah, how cool is that? And that was the first glimpse we had is like, wow, maybe it'll actually, maybe it'll actually do something. And then friends of mine started asking me if I, did you actually play on that Taylor record? Because then it started doing well, but I don't listen to a lot of country radio. And so I didn't actually realize how well it was doing Incredible. <laughs> until friends were coming back and saying like, dude, it's like whatever it was on the charts or whatever, blah, blah, blah. So when we went in to do album number two, the Fearless record, that honestly was one of the coolest moments because we were going in same band, same 
four guys going into the studio with her and but we knew already it was going to be a multi-million record i mean we may not have known how big it was going to be but we knew it was going to be big so it was the first time i remember sitting in the studio uh, like helping to arrange and work through these tunes knowing that this was going to be a huge record you know you know i mean you know the first time that happened to you and you're like oh no this is this is already a big record and we haven't even started recording it yet you know (laughs) amazing Well, her, yeah. I mean, her her rise to fame was just a rocket, and if we, and you you know you you were there, part of that whole thing, and the nucleus. I remember you and Tim, and I worked with Tim, and I remember you guys being kind of unstoppable because I've been in the same rhythm section for you know twenty three years, you know, and That's you right. finish each other's sentences. Um, but I haven't. What's up with my, Tim? I haven't seen him. Is he is he all right? Is Tim is doing great? You know, he is one of the most understated, and um, I don't know how to. Now, how to explain him like you don't know how great he is until you until you realize and you're like holy shit how come i never knew how freaking insane he is you know because yeah. he's such a soulful smooth bass player um and he has such a dry personality um it's uh, it's great he's like uh you know how it is when you know somebody that well and whatever else he's actually uh, he is going to be doing Jules tour this next this summer. Sorry, this summer. Great. And so, uh, if you if you're a Jewel fan, you go out there and you'll see him be playing bass with her. But he's no, he's doing great. That is awesome. Oh, yeah, it's been way too long. I gotta I gotta seek him out. What was this thing recently where, um, you know, I probably should have read the trades a little bit more closely. But so the uh, Taylor's live drummer Matt Billingsley, dear friend of ours. He had to re-record yeah. some of the masters. Like, what was the deal with that? Like, and so he had to transcribe yeah. your stuff and then like yeah. nail it, do it note for note. That's got to be strange and, but I, it's still kind of cool. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So actually, I just saw Matt earlier today. Actually, um, he and I didn't know this until he and I were talking about this. I know that. I mean, I knew obviously. So Taylor took these older records because of everything that went on with big machine and all that drama, she decided to re-record them. So she had the rights to those recordings, gotcha. you know, and she wanted her, her band essentially played on them uh, on these recordings. And she wanted them to be as exact to the originals as possible. So she gave the different guys in the band the actual stems are from the the tracks from the recording so matt got solo drum tracks from the fearless record right amazing and so so we were hanging out here one day uh he lives like less than half a mile down the road from me okay. so he came over he came over here and we were just yeah catching up we hadn't seen each other in a real long time and he was like oh man i'm all up in nick view ghost note world right now or have been up in whatever and i was like why what's going on he's like well i had to learn all of your stuff for the fearless recording i was like you did why <laughs> like i wouldn't want to have to do that <laughs> like you know and so that's what they that's what they did to make those records um uh you know i'm to be honest i'm not exactly sure why she did it like that i think she could have had done anything she wanted to she could have done her version of how she sees that record now and right. it would have been super cool um but you know, yeah, because I, I did run into Amos at at, at uh, Mas Tacos, and one yeah. of the time, one of the few times I was trying, starting to try to get out last year, and um, he was like, "Yeah, man, I'm in Tim Marks land right now, dude. It's just like soaking up the mastery of Tim Marks." Yeah, that's right, and it's subtle. It's subtle to get all that stuff right. You know, it's not yeah. uh, you're not just learning a line; you're learning all the little subtleties that make it groove and make it cool you know right and so this is awesome so you so she's having this meteoric success you can kind of like hang your hat on it because it's so great to be able to have let's face it in this industry we don't want to drop names but if we really need to we're in an elevator you got to have your elevator pitch you're like hey i'm nick i played on those those four taylor swift records people are going to go like hey okay like yeah i can hire you dude uh you know what's your rate for a song or how much your card is like you know let's do this let's get you on the books right thank god for being able to hang our hat on those things absolutely i i I am and even at the time that we were doing them i didn't understand the long-term effect of of what that would have for me you know not only um 
I, I just think it, it really, uh, it led to so much stuff, but it also just gave a nice foundation for anything that was to come, you know, uh, like, like many friends of mine have said, it's like, it's a, it's a seat at the table. You don't, you no longer, and it's, and it's not a seat that you lose after a while. Once you have that seat at the table, it's yours, you know? Yeah. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah you just got to keep, you know, uh, exceeding expectations and, you know, laying it down with a smile on your face, you know? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Which and it did. It led to, it led to so many cool things that came from there and a good understanding and, and perspective of what I, what to expect out of this industry. I mean, that's a, that's a huge topic right there, but it, it was a, there was a lot of learning to be done. You know? Well, plus you're probably thinking to yourself, Oh my God, this is such a meteoric record. This next record is such a me. It's, it's being distributed internationally, globally. Next thing you know, special payments, checks are coming in. You're like, I'm putting on a whole new wing on my house. You know, uh, that's right. when the, when the like artist sells in- internationally, yeah. that's a great check. Huge. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, when we were debating, uh, yeah, so how much are we going to make playing on this record? The, I didn't understand the big picture of it doesn't matter. Just <laughs> if the record's going to do well, just make it happen. You know, just so, do it. No, it was, it was a nice, it was a nice uh, enlightening thing. And it made me think about those guys that were in Nashville making records in the 90s. 90s and those early guys. 2000s. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those, those are sales that I can't even, I mean, talk about meteoric. I mean, and, and multiple, like playing up with on five. Uh, Shania Twain, Paul Lyme on Shania Twain. Twain. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. What even the checks he's getting now have got to be good on that, you know? Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Crazy. Oh my God. Different time in the music industry. We, we have to kind of jib and jab now a little bit. Um, wear a lot of hats. We have to be a uh, Jack of all trades, master of all kind of like these days, you know? Um, oh, yeah. How are you? Is my friend John still at Noble and Cooley? I, it's been a while. Are you still? Are you enjoying those drums? I am very much am. Yeah, yes. John is has been. I, I don't speak with him as much because there's a um, a sort of a newer artist relations guy there named Luke Garrow. Gotcha. And so Luke is the guy that I talk to mostly. Um, but John is the guy that uh, partly through you yeah. that got me that kind of got me into that world and. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I I love it. Uh, they're actually in the process of making me a new kit right now. That is awesome. Um, that yeah, because I, I remember I, I remember watching MTV, being a child of MTV, and one of my heroes was this cat. You probably remember him, uh, Denny Carmasi. He played with Gamma, and then he played with Heart, um, and he always uh, had okay. the black, jet black, crazy, you know, romantics hair with a jet black Noble and Cooley drum set with black drumsticks, black heads and black pasty color sounds. And I was like, this, I like That's this. Right. Dude. So I remember, the, <laughs> yeah. I remember how cool those, you know, those, uh, those drums were. And so you're here in Nashville, big dog representing the brand. I think at the time that you connected with them, you were playing with Dolly. What was the thing with Dolly? Were you doing TV shows or live? Like that's, tell us a Dolly story, man. You know I mean? Yeah, she's so man. iconic and something tells me well, that was, she's just a nice was- gal. Oh man, she's as as many of the things as you hear about Dolly. It doesn't even begin. Like, she's amazing. She yeah. really is amazing. Um, I have worked with her producer uh, Kent Wells for many years, yeah. and at one point, uh, the drummer that she had had with her on the road, um, they parted ways, and she decided, kind of as a Dolly's the kind of person that no matter how many. Uh, no matter how many accomplishments she crushes, she's always up for a challenge. Yeah. And she decided to do a tour without a drummer. Um, <laughs> she was like, we don't even need this. I'm just going to keep my band, which was essentially three other guys. And then they were just going to have drum tracks to play to. Wow. So Kent um, asked if I could play all like her whole set essentially in the studio. And they, um, I, so it was, and they wanted to kind of go back to the original vibe, like like nine to five and two doors down and all those tunes, um, kind of more of the, the early, the retro kind of vibe on them, but obviously in the way that they do them live. So I recorded all those things for her um, and, and got paid very nicely for that. Never met her in all that, in all that time. And then every time she wanted to add a song to the set or change it up, he would call me, hey, man, can you come in? Like she wants to add whatever song. I'd go in and voice them, done and done. You know, And normally it would literally be 20 minutes of me being in the studio, kind of go through, understand what they wanted to do, 
record it, see you later, you know, and then it would happen often. And then I got to play on one of her records, um, which was which was awesome because having that voice come through the headphones I bet. when you're recording, you know, is so cool. And there were some songs that we did quite a few takes on, uh, you know, making adjustments, blah, 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 whatever. And a singer in that scenario doesn't have to sing more than a couple times. He wants, if the tempo isn't changing and the form is pretty much the same and now you're just going to performance, singers can go and listen from the control room. Yeah. She wanted to sing every single time. That is know? awesome. It was, and it was right. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then because they didn't have a touring drummer, when she got asked to do the late night shows or whatever, um, they asked me if I would do those with her as well. So the first time... I saw the Noble and Cooley kit that I have now that it's not kind of my, it, it is my A session kit was at the Jimmy Fallon show um, that Dolly was playing. I, I got to the studio cause that's pretty close to where Noble and Cooley is headquartered up there in the Northeast. Oh, you're right. um, yeah. So, cause they're in like Northeast mass, you know, and Jimmy right. Fallon saving out of um, New York. So I go in there into the studio and there's the kit sitting on the, that's the first time I saw it was sitting on the riser at the, at the Fallon show. Nice. And uh, yeah, it was awesome. So, and it's still awesome. I got to tell you side note from the Dolly thing, that Noble and Cooley kit gets more attention from engineers that like, okay, cool. Noble and Cooley kit. And then either at the end of the session or sometimes like what's, so what's, and they ask, sorry, ask me questions about the kick drum. What's one of them? I'm like, I, you know what? It's a kit. It sounds good. I don't know, but to them, it's 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 got some magic to it. You know, there's something nice. in there that I'm I'm lucky. Yeah, even happen. Questlove, anyway. he's like, yeah, man. Questlove sees that's you. right. <laughs> yeah, man. Good, right. good job on the Noble yeah. Coolies. <laughs> yeah, let me let me give you my card. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I loved working with Dolly, I, and it might pop up again at some. I'm, I really, really have no idea. But so, yeah, how do awesome. you how do you like how do you know how, what to um, what the charge for like, say, I'm going to do a show. I'm going to be record this and you're going to go do a 60 city tour and I won't be there every night, but I'll be there. Right. So, so is that how you kind of have to like, I'm sure the listeners are probably like, yeah, how do I do? And I remember back in the day when loops were like coming back again, you would like send loops out to somebody would call you in a panic. You would fire off some loops and then you would send them an invoice. How do we do our, right. how do you do your pricing? Well, you can negotiate a little bit depending on what it is. Most of the things with session works, obviously, sort of union based, right? I mean, they right. have scales. You're working within one of those scales, and that's what you get paid for a three yeah. hour session. For this kind of scenario, it was a little different. They could have opted to go by the union and pay a per show rate, or they offered to just buy me out. Buy. And it would obviously for a negotiated rate. Gotcha. And that's what I, that I was like, that's fine. Because partially what it meant was they paid me a chunk for when I did the, all of them. And then I could go back and kind of get that same chunk every time I went back, even to do a, a song. Cause she wanted to add something else to the set or whatever. Nice. So it completely, I, I was perfectly okay with the arrangement we came up with. It was perfectly fine. So uh, yeah. Yeah. You got to be able, you gotta really be able to sell funny. yourself, right? You got to be able to have ne strong negotiating skills and be flexible and all that. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you've got to come in knowing that you're bringing something to the table. Even if there's a ton of guys that can do it, whatever, you're the guy that they called. There must be a reason for it. And it's worth something. Yeah. Now, there is, a, there is a line there. Sure. You know, you, if you have a yourself, yeah, they're going to get somebody else. Yeah. But there is... But you can go up to that line, and and even if you're coming in a little bit underneath it, it's okay as long as you're happy with what it is that you're getting paid for the thing. Yeah, you know, it's no, there's no reason to be shooting for the moon because you heard that somebody else is getting whatever. If you're happy making either what they're offering you or a little more than that, and you can negotiate up to that point, be happy that you that you are the guy they want for it. And that you're making what you want to make. I mean, what are we after here? You know? Yeah, <laughs> so, totally. Yeah. Well, I remember, yeah. um, I remember I, I was lucky enough, uh, the call came in and I did some of those 
walk on and walk off tracks for the ACMs or the CMA. So a celebrity will come out and you play the, the walk on walk off music. And that was like a nice check for like a couple of years. And then there was a couple of times where I did a backing track for Dolly, Kenny Rogers, the Rascal Flats, and like a couple other people. And the, there was going to be a band on stage, but they were going to mime to the track that I recorded. So it was like, this right. is cool. I mean, I still have never played with Dolly in person. Doesn't she have um, a, a, a musician, a drummer that, that she's worked with for like 30 years? Steve Turner. Doesn't he occasionally so come he, out? He had, been, he had been the guy. Um, and then, and, and then they parted ways. Gotcha. He has been the guy for a very long time. You know, yeah. uh, even, I think even I might've actually, I can't remember the timeline. I might've actually played on a, the record of hers before. And then they parted ways and then they called me to do that, all that live stuff or, yeah. or you know, the tracks. Um, but yes, he had been the guy for a long time. Well, Hey, any other stories or that stick out over the years, you know, with this huge, you know, working with Martina or Edwin or like, I love that Maya Sharp record or Derek trucks, yeah. um, things that stand out recording wise or gig wise, things that you're really proud of that you think are going to stand the test of time. You know, um, that's a tough question because I record a lot of things where, I mean, obviously the the stuff that the stuff that stands out um, is often the stuff from the, the from the big artists because it's like, how cool is it that I like I working with Lionel Richie? That was a kind of a mind blowing moment, right? He comes in with his entourage and tell, is telling stories about when they recorded Brick House, and that's that's <sighs> pretty cool. And then and hearing his voice in the headphones. Now, what was that recording? Was that for a award show or something? That was for, uh, he did that um, duets record with um, all the different country artists. Oh, did you do the one that, um, that Al Dean sang on? No, I didn't get to do that one. I got, it was, I think the, it, Crom, Chad Cromwell was one of the guys, was, did a chunk of that record and I did a little bit of that record. Um, and I'm blanking right now on who it was that I, what that were the duets. But anyway, no, I did not do that one. <laughs> um, but but uh, gosh, I wish I could. I wish I could tell you right now what I think would be the things. But I, I, w- I will say this: I am fortunate that more stuff that I play on is stuff that I think is cool and I'm bringing something to than is a manufactured process. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, so, in general, I'm pretty grateful for for the spot that I'm in at the moment. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah. And you and you were producing some folks too. Are you still interested in that? You know the the yeah chick singer that gets off the bus, you know, from Iowa, and she's like, "I've got five songs, and I'm looking and right. I trust Nick." I you know what? I haven't done a lot of the, the completely random things like that. There's normally a, a story, some sort of a relationship that led to this thing. Yeah. I'm actually working with this um, young lady at the moment named Lily King, who uh, I actually know like her dad and my wife's mom were have been friends for 20 something years her scenario in the music business led to a conversation that led to me and all of a sudden i'm producing stuff on her and it just so happens she's incredibly talented and the stuff that we're doing we've been working on it since um last uh fall or something like that and um and it's great and and who knows what happens, but I'm certainly giving it mile because I think it's I think it's super cool. Um, I uh, and that you know how it is on the production side of things. I mean, you you try and find the the, the best talent of what you of what's out there, and it when it works, it, it's great. You know, when you feel like what you're bringing is really great for the thing, and that the artist is really bringing to the table whenever. You know, we're we're doing vocals next week, finishing up the last little vocal touches on the, the last five songs that we did. And um I, I can't wait to for it to get mixed and, and have it done, you know. So who I don't know when this record is gonna come out, but it's in the process, you know. Do you do you and, um <clears throat> get in there and shape waveforms with vocal tuning and all that stuff, or do you have a guy that helps you? I I I actually I've reconnected with Chad Carlson who did all the Taylor stuff and he and I've worked for years together Perfect. and he's so good at stuff and honestly we haven't tuned a lot with Lily because she's such a good singer so that's great a couple of things that aren't perfect are still great because it's in the vibe you know what I mean um, but I but I do I sit in my studio here um, when when I get home with all the tracks I don't record full band stuff at home uh, because there's so many 
great studios in town. Right. So I'll, we'll go track somewhere and then I'll do everything else here. Well, overdubs and vocals and all that sort of stuff. And I'll spend a lot of time here just combing through tracks and making sure things are where I want them to be and moving. If I need to move some things around, I do that and blah, 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 whatever. Um, and I love doing that stuff. That's, that's, it's making music, you know, it's, yeah, it's totally. awesome. So yeah. do you have a go-to um, second instrument? Like, do you, are you the guy that likes to strum a guitar on his couch like Chad Cromwell? Or do you like to get on the keyboards like Jim Riley? Do you, ha do you find yourself doing that kind of stuff? Or You know, uh, one of my goals, especially, especially having a little five-year-old, is, is getting into playing piano. Because I, I'm uh, fortunate and unfortunate in the way that I never learned how to play drums. I never thought about it. I just played. I never had lessons as a kid. I really just sat down and started playing drums. And what that did was uh, make me incredibly impatient when it comes to having to learn anything. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, especially yeah. we're around such great players all the time. It's like, well, if I can't do that, what am I even doing here? <laughs> you know. Yeah. So um, we have a piano that we just got this downstairs, and um, I I find the time when I can find the time, and I sound like a literally like a the kindergartner on it, and that's yeah. fine. You know, it's I, so frustrating. I do learn quick. It is frustrating. I'm I'm only thankful that I know that um, I know that I'm musical and I pick up stuff fast, so right. that's fine. Well, you have uh, a musical course, mind, you know. I mean, new, you know. You have a musical mind. You're a great yeah. musician. It's pretty interesting, man, to think that you didn't take lessons because it's your approach sounds like you mastered the first 10 pages of David Garibaldi's Future Sounds book. You know, the control yeah. between an accented note and an unaccented note, which is really the difference that separates really like the men from the boys, really, is that control over ghost notes, non-accented notes, and accented notes. And that usually comes from... Classical training on a pad, marching band yeah. training. So, like, I mean, I did all that stuff. So, did you? So, did you yeah. never want to learn on work on the timpani, marimba stuff? You just went right towards the drums. I never did. I just wanted to play drum set. Yeah, and Amazing. and my first semester at Berkeley, I had um, you know, you have your private private instruction. My teacher, the first thing uh, she it was it was a she she did was look. At, she was like your hands we've got to do something there because you're only going to hurt yourself if you keep like I had gone through playing in high school with all these different bands, like really we're playing along with records for so many hours. It's insane. Like I, that's, I learned how to play drums by playing along with my favorite artists and then recording myself and listening to myself playing on, I had an electronic kit. So, because we were in a little apartment. So yeah. uh, I would play along to stuff. Uh, that I loved and I would record it and I would listen to that when I was going to sleep at night and listen to how I was playing over James Taylor, Van Halen, Metallica, Eagles, whatever. Wow, you know? that's really smart. And, and that's how I learned how to play was try trying to copy all these different things, S but no technique, right? I mean, I was, who, who knows? I can't remember it, but she was like, we've got to re we got to take something apart here and so i i didn't it's not like i had to start again but i had to think about how i was holding drumsticks so that i could get past a certain point right who was that, and, was that like um, like a shiri miracle or someone or who, who was the, the female drummer i the, wish i could remember yeah I, I honestly can't remember I, I i had her for one semester and then i'm not even sure if she continued to teach a break i'm not even sure who else was um, there like rod morgenstein and and like kenwood denard and that crew crew or Emma Denard was there for a part of the time that I was there. Casey um, Sherrill, maybe? Guy, if I could, who? Casey Sherrill was definitely there. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I'm, why am I blanking on all names? But anyway, yeah, yeah. There, it, was, it, was, it was interesting because it was obviously such a heavy jazz school, and I was, you know, pretty much right out of high school. I took a semester off, but other than that, I was out of high school and not into jazz. I wanted to learn how to just i just want to play drums actually yeah. is really all i wanted to do <laughs> so i went through a few that were just over me like i didn't do the homework i didn't do whatever until i found the guys that that you know got it like groove guys that were more yeah. into what i wanted to do and then obviously i expanded out into some jazz and latin stuff and whatever else but i just wanted to be like the the Picaro or like the you know whatever at that point you know totally so, yeah yeah man yeah well got it all worked yeah. out that's pretty incredible that you have that it you were did. just you were just called to it man you really were I mean it's like 
I, I can't imagine. Like I always played along to records, but you know, I spent eight years on a 50 yard line wearing a snare drum in the freezing cold. And that really informed uh, my yeah. technique, you know, like, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, thank God for that. Some people are just natural. I mean, I don't think that Tommy Lee, Tommy Lee, when he came out the, of the womb, it was like, right. There is a rock drummer. Like he doesn't think that he's, yeah. Think about playing rim shots. He just hits the drum and it's a giant fat rim shot. I don't think he's premeditating anything. He's just such a natural, no. you know? Yeah. Yeah. At that thing. Yeah. A hundred percent. I honestly, if I had, if there had been drum corps around my world when I was in high school, I would have done it. I mean, yeah. I would have definitely, I wish I had had some of that in my past, but it just wasn't. It just wasn't there, you know. What was and, the high school in uh, Nashville? What was where you? It, I went to. It was a school called the University School of Nashville. Gotcha. And it, it it was like a liberal arts private school, and I actually would attribute a lot of my early playing to the ability to play there all the time. I mean, I was in the pep band and the jazz band, and the pep band would go out and play with our basketball team wherever they would play. So I would be playing, you know, doing all that stuff. And I got I got to play a lot in high school, and that and it was both good because eighth grade was when I kind of started coming on show, meeting friends, and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of that was through music because yeah. another drummer there and I became friends, and he was the cool guy. So I started hanging out, you know, blah blah blah, all the stuff. Um, I would attribute a lot of it to to playing and getting to do that so much, you know. So Is that, that was school still there? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And my kid goes there like Addy, Addy just did, you know, they do like assessment stuff or whatever. So um, assuming all goes well, she'll be starting there in, in the fall. So, oh, yeah. they've got to be really proud to use a, an alumni. Do you have to go to like the, well, the, the, the meetings and be like, hey, can we use your image to promote our school? What's funny, I tap to help put together the uh, whatever alumni party this year. And it's cool because I got to hang out with a couple of old friends of mine from high school because Nash for some reason USN kids end up coming back to Nashville at some point everybody leaves and then X amount of years later everybody comes back <laughs> so um, uh, so I'm helping them out but I'm going to be out playing on the weekend that it happens anyway so I'm not <laughs> so I'm not even going to get to go but um, but yeah I I will say my time there was a lot of fun and this friend of mine this other drummer Jason and I, for graduation, did a big double drum solo. I mean, there's only 40-something kids in my class. Yeah. And there's the steps everybody stands on, and then two huge drum sets set up. So we kind of we, – we got pretty infamous from, from doing that, you know, um, being that being in class, you know. Did Jason fun. go on yeah. to do some stuff? He did. He actually he's in the in the general programming world now, not music related at all. But he was actually in the Mummies for a while, which is a very popular funk band here in Nashville that just does a lot of corporate stuff or whatever. Um, but no, not not that much other than that. Yeah. So as a as a Nashvillian that's been here a long time since age 13, do you like our new Nashville? Do you like what's happening? Progress, condos, the what's your thoughts on this? Uh, you know, a little, um, I would say mostly, yes, I, I do like this Nashville. It's, I like that, how much it's moved forward, sure. many, how much variety we have here now and how, and how much that was forced by such a huge influx of, of folks from New York, folks from LA, all that sort of stuff. It made the, it made our industry a lot tougher because as the pie got smaller, the, there were so many more fish <laughs> trying to get a piece, you know, Yeah. but, um, but other than, you know, for the most part, um, I do like it. It is obviously becoming a lot less affordable for, I don't know how young guys now are even doing it because I mean, you can't get an apartment seemingly for under a grand a month. Good luck, you know? And how do you do that when you're trying to get a gig or trying to whatever it is, you know? Yeah. So I can imagine it's tough, um, but I, I actually like it. I, and I don't like the fact that, a good chunk of music grow has gone the way of condos. I wish that somehow could have been spared, but I think it goes to show kind of the way the music industry went, right? I mean, a lot of those studios weren't making the money to, to that the owners of the, that those properties found it worth it to keep them, right? I mean, that's yeah. really what happened. 
I mean, and we so, still have our ocean way, you know, we still have our sound emporium. We still have our sound kitchen. We still have our, our, our front stage, backstage, Ronnie's place, station West County. Key. I mean, that's a lot. That's more than most. Oh, music gosh. cities. You I, know? I'm sure we're still studio capital of the world as far as the numbers and the level of studio that that is here yes. uh but not as many of them are on music row music row has almost shifted to barry hill a little bit you know barry hill's and, in the music uh, row yeah yeah and that's i mean that is what it is as, as long as there's studios to work at i'm not i'm not overly traditional and like oh man it sucks that they're not all on 16th avenue anymore but right. um and of course when you drive down if you're visiting nashville you can go down Music Row and you still get to see all the awesome publishing companies and these little houses with the big signs of who's just had a number one and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I, th I don't think that's ever going away. It just, it did get a little over bombarded with new hotels and condos, but, but at the same time, you can't really have growth without growth. You know I mean? It's, it's all part of the deal, you know? Totally. Uh, we can't always have it the way we want it. So I, I do think in general, I do like Nashville. I like all the fancy restaurants. I like eating really oh, good yeah. food. You know? I do. There's a lot of fancy, the five-star restaurants that are, you know, the one word like Husk or, you know, like Rolf, yeah. and, you know, yeah. and, and, and it's, but a lot of them are still very, um, it's like Southern fusion. You know what I mean? Where it's there like, there's a lot. Yeah. Still, I still tell you what though. I went to a place um, uh, just the other night with some friends. It, it, it is pricey, but it, it's called the Continental. Have you been there? It's in Continental. the new Continental. Yeah, it's in the new Grand Hyatt, I believe it is. Oh, okay. It's downtown. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, there's it, I, this is the thing. I remember being in Nashville where when a new restaurant opened, you're like, okay, I've got to make it over there. And you kind of kept track of like what was happening and keeping up with like the cuisine that was going on in this town. Now, I mean, come on, like the, I, I, there's no ways you could possibly keep up. And uh, like it, it, almost any time I want to go out to a restaurant, it could be a new restaurant within a mile of my house. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, the amount of places that have opened up over the last five years is insane. You know, oh, but, yeah. uh, it's nice to be in a city like that. That's growing like that. And, you know, if you've been fortunate enough to take part in, in whether it's real estate or it's some part of the growing part of the city, then, I mean, you know, good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, man. Well, yeah. you know, we got kids that are want to move here, the crazy kids, and they want to do something creative. They want to play the drums. They want to sing. They want to get a record deal. They want to have a publishing deal. In, in the 20 years that you've been here, what would be just some quick takeaways that you would say to a kid over a beer? Hey, do this. Don't do that. Well, I would say go out and listen to some writer's nights. There's a ton of them over here all the time. And yeah, one out of 20 uh, singer songwriters you, you may like, you know, and, and the rest aren't going to be your cup of tea. Um, in fact, you may go a couple nights in a row and not like anybody that you hear really, or, or the other way, you may love everybody. Whatever it is, partner yourself up to some singer songwriters that are also trying to make it happen, trying to get gigs, trying to put a band together. No, it's not going to pay anything but it's going to be real. You're going to love working with them and they're going to love working with you. Hopefully is the idea. Yeah. I'd say that's a good place to start. And then as far as making money as a player in this town, yeah, if you need to do the downtown thing, the Broadway scene with all the, all those things, I mean, that's, it's a huge scene. And from what I understand years ago, it, it was a hard work for, to make your money down there. And yeah. I've heard recently it, yes, it's still long sets and all that, but man, I think they're I think they're cleaning up. I think there, there's some dudes down there that are playing. They're making ten grand. Um, there's some guys that are down there that are making one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, hacking through three steps from Leonard Skinner and playing, you know, Hicktown, you know, twenty beats too fast. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> right. and, you know what I mean? And so, but but it, that work is. I mean, that's insane. Yeah. And I think the thing is, is it's out there and it's all about, like you say, it's, it's relationships. And even with the downtown thing, I know I've actually never done it, but I have certainly have friends that have, and I know once you get in, there are certain guys that kind of put those bands together. Yeah. Once they know that you're, you're going to show up on time, you know, the stuff, you know, all that stuff, you'll keep getting called and then you oh, can yeah. take and leave whatever you want while you got your singer songwriter gig that you're trying to add your bit to whatever and that's also a way that hopefully you might be able to get some sessions it's not going to be coming here and trying to get sessions because 
that on its own these days, I mean, it's tough enough when you've been doing it for a long time. It's not going to, a new guy definitely need to have a way in. And that's probably going to be with the artist who brings you in maybe to one of these Blackbird school sets. You know, they have those, you know, kind of things or whatever. Um, you, there's there, there's not going to just be you going up to a studio and saying, I'm here, <laughs> let's do this. You know, yeah. you're know, you going to have to find your way. And I, I think a singer-songwriter route would be the way I would go if I was moving here today. You know, yeah, it takes a while. It, it, takes, it takes a lot of going out and, and all that. But I think that's what you got to do. We were out back in the days when we we're talking about back then. We were out every night. We were out all the time. Pressing the flesh. Stuff happen. Yeah. Press, yeah. All day. Yeah. 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 yeah so. In 99, man, I was in 20. I worked with 27 different bands and singer songwriters. Most of them are not in the business anymore. Right. But you, you're, you create you create these relationships and try to hustle for that person and give them put your best foot forward and exceed their expectations with a smile on your face. And sometimes they'll 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 turn into something. And, um, you know, thank God, some of the people that we both worked with it turned into something, you know, lifelong relationships. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and you don't know, you know, you're building relationships that you don't know how they are going to come back in your life as you keep doing this. You know, you build a network of people behind you, and then somebody needs a drummer for something, and it's somebody that you haven't played with in five years, but remembered having a great gig with you, or a great session with you, or whatever, and reaches out to do, hey man, we need a sub or we need a guy to do this thing or whatever. Would you be interested? And that's the kind of stuff that keeps you got a good network. You'll always have work. You know yeah. what I mean? I think that that's, that's kind of the key. And uh, it, it happens for me all the time now where yeah. I, I get calls from people. Maybe I haven't seen. Sometimes I'm not even remembering how I know the person, but it's because we work together on something. And now they want me for something else, you know, yeah. so it could be it, years later. Like it. it could ma- fi- finally yeah. manifest itself in some way years later. So if you are out there and you're doing your thing and it doesn't turn into something right away, fret not folks, because it could be five years later that something comes along. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. That's so exactly what's coming up right. for you, pal? Yeah. What's uh, what's uh, what's on, uh, new on the horizon? Anything you'd want to promote other than Nick That's Nick B U D A.com. You could see, hear a little bit about Nick's history. You could see his studio. You could, if you're a singer songwriter, you can hire Nick to play on your record or your track or your film score. It's a great thing, man. That's right. That's right. Well, actually this is turning into being a little bit of an unusual year. Um, uh, it's weird. I started getting a couple of calls at the end of last year for gigs and I haven't been, I haven't done a road thing in a very long time. And kind of sifting through some things. And one of the calls I got is one of the things is the thing I'm going to be doing is with Chesney. Oh, wow. Oh yeah. Because yeah. Wow. Well, that's great. Well, that's, yeah. that's super high energy, giant venues. We did a double bill in 2015, all stadiums. We played 11 yeah. stadiums. And in those 11 shows, it was almost a million people. Isn't that incredible? That's great, man. Well, hey, don't. Yeah, so that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, go on. I was going to say, at the end of the night, I would have to play um, Sean's drum set. And he had Zildjian K. Constantinople's on the kit for a stadium gig. And I was like, oh, man. So I think I. It's yeah. horrible, but I cracked four of his symbols, and then, uh, and then halfway through the shows, <laughs> they they cut me off, and then so during yeah. the first show, it was a song where I was, and I had maracas in two hands and standing playing the kick drum, and then Kenny would come back there and pour all this rum down my throat while I'm playing. I'm not going to say no to him, right? And it's spilling all sure. over Sean's drums, and and then Johnny yeah. would come out during the intro and put up my little crash symbols. So I feel really bad that I crack that many so don't play the k's man for the stadium well game. first of all uh it'll be all sabians up there that's right uh, and so i actually spoke to uh my guy over at sabian when this all came through and i was like so i'm not exactly sure what my setup needs to be help me <laughs> because what because <laughs> i mean because I, I went through all like what i would normally play in, in a studio with, like the sabians that i know i love yep. and he was like well hey so some yep. of these Let's avoid, 
the expense of having to replace these every couple of weeks <laughs> and just go with, you know, and he set me up with like uh, some artisans and some whatever else is and, and some explosions and whatever else. So um, I haven't, you know what, rehearsals start at the end of this month or beginning of March, really. And um, as we go through rehearsals, I'll kind of define what my setup needs to be. And then middle of April, we start playing. So beautiful, yeah. man. And how many, how many dates? It's, I can't exactly remember. It's, it's, it's between 40 and 50. Nice. Um, till the end of August. And most of those, honestly, um, you know, we leave the Tuesday or Wednesday night, get back Sunday morning. So I'm still here being able to do sessions Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And, um, and it's kind of half stadiums, half amphitheaters. Nice. And it's, I, honestly, I feel I feel very lucky. The band, I know everybody in the band already, which is awesome. Oh, is know? it going to be Kenny and, Greenberg? Uh, and like, is it melody on bass or is it harmony? What's your, it's melody uh, or harmony? Harmony. Harmony. <laughs> it's harmony. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Harmony so, playing bass, John Connolly playing, and then John, Danny Ray yeah. is coming out. With it. Dude, that's going to be so, great. Yeah, and yeah. you're, you're going to have so much fun. But that's, you know what? I think you'll love the AAX explosions because they're still dark but they cut through yeah. and then they're 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 they can take a beating so you start using like 19s yeah. 20s 21s you're going to love them that's right yeah that's we'll see i'm going to go through a few and 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 see what works you know we all have our ear for things and and uh but yeah, yeah. it's going to be great uh everybody in that camp has been the nicest coolest person and uh I, honestly, I can't wait to get out there and kind of do some stuff. Oh, man, you yeah, get your, you get your bus this, time in, man. You, you get your bus time in. You have a couple of with your bus time. Yeah, yeah. friends, and yeah. you're going to eat well, and the, the accommodations are going to be awesome, and you'll, it'll be awesome. It's great. I didn't know that. Maybe we'll yeah, cross paths. Right. Yeah. I would love it. I would. Yeah. It would be so great. Even if we were close, like, you know, not too far of a drive away. You yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, man, this was so awesome to catch up in a public forum. We were so overdue. And I know that uh, your parents are proud. I know that your family's proud. I'm proud of you. I'm happy for you, man. You know, all the great stuff you've done in the last 20 years. I'm happy to call you a friend, man. And congratulations on everything, buddy. Yeah, you too, man. Big time. Awesome, buddy. Hey, everyone, that's Nick Buda, nickbuda.com. Check him out. Hire him to play drums for you. You can go see him on tour uh, this summer with Kenny Chesney, stadiums and amphitheaters. As always, we appreciate you guys checking out the show. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. Keep coming back for good, the good stuff. We're gonna, we're here. We're here every week. Come on, guys. All right, folks, thanks for listening. Nick, thanks so much, man. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Rich. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.